is Wacker Bank. I did need a break. Need go uh, restroom. Need some more uh, chips and a bit cola. It's not uh, chips, it's salt. Soul sticks, call soul sticks. When you're drinking, if you're drinking beers and stuff, using if you go in the town in a bar, sitting drinking. It's got uh, water. So if you own a bar, you can give uh, salt sticks away for free. Then people getting uh, thirsty. Then they buy uh, more beers and things. When you make uh, more money, like uh, peanuts, peanuts and soul sticks make you thirsty. So it's a 5, 5 p.m. I don't have a work, I have a pension, so it's not important at all what time it is, but I like to try and keep, keep a normal uh, day. I go to bed and sleep like midnight to 8 or 9 a.m. Building a computer with the required performance, size and weight demanded the use of Tron systems, which were at that time very expensive and not very reliable. Earlier efforts to use computers for guidance to lack and the system on the SM64 neighborhood had failed and were abandoned. The Air Force and Autonetics spent millions on a program to improve transistor and component reliability 100 times leading to the Minitem and Hyrule parts specifications. The techniques developed during this program were equally useful for improving all transistor construction and greatly reduced the failure rate of transistor production lines in general. This improved yield, which had the effect of greatly lowering production costs had enormous spin-off effects in the electronics industry. 15. 160 161 using a general purpose computer also had long lasting effects on the Minuteman program and the US nuclear stance in general. With Minuteman, the targeting could be easily changed by loading new trajectory information into the computer's hard drive, a task that could be completed in a few hours. Earlier ICBM's custom wired computers, on the other hand, could have attacked only a single target, whose precise trajectory information was hard-coded directly in the system's logic. 15, 156 missile gap. In 1957, a series of intelligence reports suggested the Soviet Union was far ahead in the missile race and would be able to overwhelm the US by the early 1960s. 
If the Soviets were building missiles in their numbers being predicted by the CIA and others within the defense establishment, by as early as 1961 they would have enough to attack all SAC and ICBM bases in the U.S. in a single first strike. It was later demonstrated that this missile gap was just as fictional as the bomber gap of a few years earlier, 18. But throughout the late 1950s, it was a serious concern. The Air Force responded by beginning research into survivable strategic missiles, starting the WS-199 program. Initially, this focused on air-launched ballistic missiles, which would be carried aboard aircraft flying far from the Soviet Union, and thus impossible to attack by either ICBM, because they were moving or long-range interceptor aircraft, because they were too far away. In the shorter term, looking to rapidly increase the number of missiles in its force, Minuteman was given crash development status starting in September 1958. Advanced surveying of the potential silo sites had already begun in late 1957.1946 adding to their concerns was a Soviet anti-ballistic missile system which was known to be under development at Srishigan. WS-199 was expanded to develop a maneuvering reentry vehicle, MARV, which greatly complicated the problem of shooting down a warhead. Two designs were tested in 1957 Alpha Draco and the Boost Glide reentry vehicle. These used long and skinny arrow-like shapes that provided aerodynamic lift in the high atmosphere, and could be fitted to existing missiles like Minuteman.19. The shape of these reentry vehicles required more room on the front of the missile than a traditional reentry vehicle design. To allow for this future expansion, the Minuteman silos were revised to be built 13 feet (4.0 m) deeper. Although Minuteman would not deploy a boost glide warhead, the extra space proved invaluable in the future, as it allowed the missile to be extended and carry more fuel and payload. Dot. 1946 Polaris. During Minuteman's early development, the Air Force maintained the policy that the manned strategic bomber was the primary weapon of nuclear war. Blind bombing accuracy on the order of 1,500 feet <coughs> (0.46 km) was expected, and the weapons were sized to ensure even the hardest targets would be destroyed. The Polaris SLBM could ostensibly fill the role of the Minuteman, and was perceived as significantly less vulnerable to attack dot as long as the weapon fell within this range. The USAF paid in a bombers to attack every military and industrial target in the USSR and was confident that its bombers would survive in sufficient numbers that such a strike would utterly destroy the country. 15. 202 Soviet ICBMs upset this equation to a degree. Their accuracy was known to be low, on the order of 4 nautical miles, 7.4 kilometers, 4.6 mi, but they carried large warheads that would be useful against strategic air commands bombers, which parked in the open dot since there was no system to detect the ICBMs being launched. The possibility was raised that the Soviets could launch a sneak attack with a few dozen missiles that would take out a significant portion of SAC's bomber fleet. 15. 202 In this environment, the Air Force saw their own ICBMs not as a primary weapon of war, but as a way to ensure that the Soviets would not risk a sneak attack. ICBMs, especially newer models that were housed in silos, could be expected to survive an attack via a single Soviet missile. In any conceivable scenario where both sides had similar numbers of ICBMs, the US forces would survive a sneak attack in sufficient numbers to ensure the destruction of all major Soviet cities in return. The Soviets would not risk an attack under these conditions. 15. 202 Considering this counter value attack concept, Strategic planners calculated that an attack of 400 equivalent Ngatons aimed at the largest Soviet cities would promptly kill 30% of their population and destroy 50% of their industry. 
Larger attacks raise these numbers only slightly, as all of the larger targets would already have been hit. This suggested that there was a finite deterrent level around 400 megatons that would be there to prevent a Soviet attack no matter how many missiles they had of their own. All that had to be ensured was that the US missiles survived, which seemed likely given the low accuracy of the Soviet weapons. 15. 199 reversing the problem. The addition of ICBMs to the US Air Force's arsenal did not eliminate the need or desire to attack Soviet military targets, and the Air Force maintained that bombers were the only suitable platform in that role. 15. 199 into this argument came the Navy's UGM 27 Polaris. Launched from submarines. Polaris was effectively invulnerable and had enough accuracy to attack Soviet cities. If the Soviets improved the accuracy of their missiles this would present a serious threat to the Air Force's bombers and missiles, but none at all to the Navy's submarines. Based on the same 400 equivalent megatons calculation, they set about building a fleet of 41 submarines carrying 16 missiles each giving the Navy a finite deterrent that was unassailable. 15. 197 This presented a serious problem for the Air Force. They were still pressing for the development of the bombers, like the supersonic B-70, for attacks against military targets, but this role seemed increasingly unlikely in a nuclear war scenario. A February 1960 memo by Rand, entitled The Puzzle of Polaris was passed around among high-ranking Air Force officials. It suggested that Polaris negated any need for Air Force ICBMs if they were also being aimed at Soviet cities. If the role of the missile was to present a new assailable threat to the Soviet population, Polaris was a far better solution than Minuteman. The document had long-lasting effects on the future of the Minuteman program, which, by 1961, was firmly evolving towards a counter-force capability. 15. 197 Kennedy Minuteman's final tests coincided with John F. Kennedy entering the White House. His new Secretary of Defense. Robert McNamara, was tasked with continuing the expansion and modernization of the use nuclear deterrent while limiting spending. McNamara began to apply cost-forward slash benefit analysis, and my Newtonman's low production cost made its selection a foregone conclusion. Atlas and Titan were soon scrapped, and the storable liquid fuel Titan II deployment was severely curtailed. 15. 154 McNamara also consult the XB-70 bomber project. 15. 203 Minute Man's low cost had spin-off effects on non-ICBM programs. The Army's Nike Zeus, an interceptor missile capable of shooting down Soviet warheads, provided another way to prevent a sneak attack. This had initially been proposed as a way to defend the SAC bomber fleet. The Army argued that upgraded Soviet missiles might be able to attack U.S. missiles in their silos, and Zeus would be able to blunt such an attack. Zeus was expensive and the Air Force said it was more cost-effective to build another Minuteman missile. Given the large size and complexity of the Soviet liquid-fueled missiles, an ICBM building race was one the Soviets could not afford. Zeus was cancelled in 1963.20, counterforce. Minuteman's selection as the primary Air Force ICBM was initially based on the same second strike logic as their earlier missiles, that the weapon was primarily one designed to survive any potential Soviet attack and ensure they would be hit in return. But Minuteman had a combination of features that led to its rapid evolution into the US's primary weapon of nuclear war. Chief among these qualities was its digital computer. This could be updated in the field with new targets and better information about the flight paths with relative ease, gaining accuracy for little cost. One of few unavoidable effects on the warhead's trajectory was the mass of the Earth, 
which contains many mass concentrations that boom on the warhead as it passes over them. Through the 1960s, the Defense Mapping Agency, now part of National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, mapped these with increasing accuracy feeding that information back into the Minuteman fleet. The Minuteman was initially deployed with a circular error probable, set, of about 1.1 nautical miles, 2.0 kilometers, 1.3 m, but this had improved to about 0.6 nautical miles, 1.1 kilometer, 0.69 m, by 1965.15, 166 this was accomplished without any mechanical changes to the missile 